And so it just seems as though there is not much of an appetite on the court to overturn this abysmal law and, and end the worst practice in American history. And yes, I'm including slavery on that. It goes abortion and then slavery. It is unconscionable to me that this is something that continues to go on in our country. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell that supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. One of the biggest news stories of the week is that the Supreme Court of the United States has officially agreed to take on a case out of the state of Mississippi dealing with an abortion ban. Now, this particular abortion ban that Mississippi enacted would ban all abortions after 15 weeks. So it's not quite as strict as Alabama's abortion ban, which bans them outright. I mean, just completely bans all abortions unless there were special considerations, for example, rape or life of the mother, that kind of thing. Mississippi, a little bit different. So they do allow for abortions up to 15 weeks. And the reason that this is important is because generally, generally speaking, the viability argument has been the standard. So originally you had Roe versus Wade, which established it as a right. Then after that, you had Casey uh, versus Planned Parenthood. And in that case, what the Supreme Court essentially decided is that viability was the standard that you're going by. And so the 15-week the ban would actually ban a child's, uh, ban anybody from getting an abortion before vitality, because generally speaking, infants are not viable at 15 weeks. 20 weeks is about the earliest that we can keep them alive outside of the womb. And so because of that, that has kind of become the, the de facto standard. It's, it's not an official standard that the Supreme Court suggested. It's just 20 weeks seems to be about where viability lies. And so because of that, this bill does have the potential. It could potentially overturn Roe v. Wade and Casey versus Planned Parenthood. That could happen. Whether or not it will happen remains to be seen, but it, it does revolve around that case. And the thing is, though, you have to remember, as one of my law professors once said, the wheels of ju justice turn slowly. And that's probably the most true thing he said in his entire class. Learned a lot from him, but that was probably the main thing that he drove home that, that I tried to remember. That and the stuff that I learned about land rights, but that was the main one. That Just remember, no matter... What issue it is, no matter what law we're talking about, the wheels of justice tend to turn slowly. And so this is probably not going to be something that they rule on until June. The way the Supreme Court typically functions is they may start hearing this case in October. So it's a long ways out, but they have had at least four justices that said, yeah, it's, it's worth taking, taking a look at. And so we don't, I don't know exactly which of those four justices it, it was, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was Gorsuch, Alito, um, Amy Coney Barrett, and Thomas. I believe those are the four, which really should surprise nobody. I don't believe that Kavanaugh uh, would have been one of the ones that was in favor of that. I, I very much doubt John Roberts would. And that actually brings me up to where we can go with this. The, the court is probably not going to rule on this until June. And the reason is because typically... The court does its more boring cases or the ones that are less controversial earlier in the year, and they tend to save the ones that they're pretty certain are going to be kind of contentious until June. And so if I had to guess, and, and this is probably the biggest Supreme Court case that is going to be heard this year, maybe there could be one that's bigger. I don't know. You know, that's the way politics happens sometimes. Sometimes there's something over the horizon that you didn't foresee that's going to come up that would be much bigger, but I can't foresee unless there is maybe another abortion case that would even have a, a closer tie to abortion and uh, the potential to overturn Roe v. Wade, maybe that could happen. I, I tend to see it as unlikely. But that's a possibility. But more than likely, what we're going to see is this case is going to be the one that they decide to basically make a ruling on, on abortion with, and they're probably going to hang it out to dry until most likely June, because this is probably going to be their biggest case of the year. In fact, I would not be at all surprised if the high court decides to do this case last. It may be the last case of the, the session that we hear out of them. I don't know, but it would not surprise me if that winds up being the case. So basically, 
the thing that you need to know about this law is there are three ways that this particular law could go. The first way is that it reaffirms Casey slash Roe, depending on how you look at it. It could affirm one or the other or both. Casey's really more the standard, more than Roe is now, but Roe's the one that everybody's familiar with. But if it reaffirms the viability standard that was set by Casey versus Planned Parenthood, then what's probably going to wind up happening is nothing. And it does look bad, and having another case, and the vote may have some effect on it, but as Justice Clarence Thomas said, court precedence really doesn't matter. And the reason is because whenever the court believes that a, or where the, I shouldn't say the court, whenever a justice, an individual justice, sees that a decision was wrongly decided, then they ignore court precedent. And whenever they believe that it is rightly decided, they just use court precedent as an excuse for why they believe what they believe. And he's absolutely right about that. Typically speaking, the justices don't take into account whether or not a, a decision was actually reached by a former court. Now, they may hang their hat on that and say, well, I came to this decision because look at court precedent, but then they'll completely ignore court precedent in a case that they believe was decided incorrectly. And so really, precedent doesn't mean anything. All it is is a veil to disguise the fact that you agreed with the previous court. And so because of that, I, I don't really see that being a big deal. You know, let, let's say, I don't think that this would happen, but let's say that we get a six to four decision that you have, or six to four, that would be 10 justices, I'm sorry. It's been a long day. Uh, let's, let's say that we got a six to three decision. Now, I do not see that happening, but let's say that we got a six to three decision uh, for upholding the viability standard as set forth by Casey. Could that happen? Yeah. But at the end of the day, would it do anything in the future? I actually argue no. And there's a lot of lawyer friends that I have that would say, well, that would be really bad because it would be a 6-3 a decision that would set a precedent and then it would be harder to... No, it wouldn't. Because if you get a bunch of liberal justices in there that agree with abortion, then they're going to agree with it no matter what court precedent is. Then if you get people that actually look at the original intent of the law and understand individual rights, human rights, the, the right to life, primarily uh, amongst all of those, even more important than liberty or property, then they're going to just look at those previous cases and say that was wrongly decided, just like Casey was wrongly decided. And so this really isn't going to make a difference. And so I, that's the scenario that we're looking at first. The second scenario and the second way we could see this going, and I think that this one is possible, is that SCOTUS re basically re-establishes Casey's viability standard or upholds the Mississippi law on very narrow ground. So it either does something to systematically alter the standard that Casey set to a new standard, something either other than viability or an adjusted version of viability, or maybe it does technically uphold Mississippi's state law, but it does so on very shaky, very narrow legal ground. And we've seen that the court has a tendency to do this. They don't like to make big decisions. They tend to basically play around with the edges as opposed to going for a knockout punch. Even when, you know, you look at the original decision of Roe, it was absolutely a knockout punch. It was a big sweeping change done by the court. The court tends to not like to do that. And those, you could look at exceptions, but generally speaking, they, they like to kind of tinker around the edges, especially with John Roberts as the chief justice. And so because of that, I could very easily see that being what happens. Um, for the viability standard to be drastically altered, uh, you need... Here's the thing. The people that are in play right now are Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Gorsuch. You'll notice that I did not list in that grouping Justice Roberts because Justice Roberts is going to side with the liberals. Every single thing we have seen from the pattern so far, like when you're looking at whether or not a baseball player is has a high likelihood of hitting a home run, you don't look at his lifetime stats. You look at his recent stats. And that's what I'm doing here with Justice Roberts. Over the past three or four years especially, Justice Roberts has sided with the liberal justices on every case that is even somewhat controversial. He's really been doing that for about five or six years now, really since the Obama care case. I, I can't think of any really big controversial case off the top of my head. Maybe there is one, and feel free to 
correct me on that in the comment section below. But as far as all of the big controversial cases that would make a big deal, he doesn't mind signing with the conservatives on the things where it doesn't really do much, but on something like this that could drastically change the landscape of legal scholarship in America, Justice Roberts tends to always side with the liberals. Or he might side with the conservatives, but he does so on very narrow ground. And that's another thing that we have to consider here, is that if he does, you know, let's say that we have a decision that we know for a fact is going to go against abortion, and Kavanaugh and Gorsuch join on with that opinion. Well, what Roberts might do is switch sides, because, you know, he's Roberts. Roberts might actually switch sides to give us a 9-3 opinion for upholding the Mississippi law, but he will weaken the opinion in doing so. Justice Roberts does this a lot. If you've read parts of, for example, his biography, there are records that straight up admit to this, that there are times where he was on one side of the argument and to make it less controversial, he jumped on the other side and wound up siding in a different way just to try to uphold the appearance of the court and to make the decision that they were making, which he previously disagreed with, make it less impactful. This is the way that Roberts operates. The guy's a politician. He's not a judge. And so I could very much see that happening, that even if it's something that would weaken Roe or Casey, but, but wouldn't go all the way, that Justice Roberts decides, ah, I want to weaken it even a little bit more. Uh, it, or, I, I, the opposite, actually. Uh, I want to make sure that this changes less, so I'm going to join the prevailing side so that I can water down the opinion. That could happen. In fact, I, if we do get a decision that goes in our favor, I would even say that that is likely to happen. Now, the likelihood of this scenario, because as I said, the, the previous scenario where just nothing changes, I'd give that like a 74, 75% chance of happening. It's high. I, I think that we're probably going to get no change. And this is just based on watching the court and what they've done recently. I could be wrong, but Kavanaugh and Gorsuch do scare me on this. And I like Gorsuch, and in a lot of ways, Gorsuch is a, a jurist after my own heart, but then there are some ways where he's the exact opposite of me. I, I, we've seen that we cannot rely on Gorsuch, for example, to be originalist in the Title IX case, where he essentially asserted, okay, well, yeah, that's not, and admitted in his opinion, well, that's not what the jurist actually meant originally, but regardless of what they meant, this is what, and so, you know, he played games with it, and it, it was just a really, really bad, oddly enough, Kavanaugh showed a ridiculous amount of restraint that I was not expecting from him in that one particular case. But anyway, for this to work out, we don't just need Gorsuch, and we don't just need Kavanaugh. We need them both. And frankly, on this, I think both of them are a coin toss. And so then you have to ask yourself, what are the odds of winning two coin tosses in a row? It's 25%. Not nothing, but not great. And so that's actually what I'm anticipating here. I think that the fact that we get something that actually weakens Roe v. Wade or the standard set up by Casey, there's like maybe a 25% chance of that. Now, granted, 25% is significantly better than the like 2% that we had with Kennedy. And so on that note, I would have to say that this is significantly more promising than we've had in a really long time. So that is something to be excited about. And then there's the third option, which is they just completely overturn Roe. I would love for this to happen. This is the result that I am pulling for. But to be perfectly blunt, I just don't think it's going to happen. There's maybe a 1% chance of that. So to recap, about a, I would say, this is just my odds, 74% chance nothing happens, 25% chance that they do something, and what that something is, I don't know. They might, they might reset the viability standard. They might tinker around and uphold the Mississippi law on, on very narrow grounds. And if they do, then Roberts is probably going to join the prevailing side and water it down. So it's going to do even less than it would if Justice Roberts were not there because he is a cancer on the Supreme Court. Uh, and I think will go down as one of the worst Supreme Court justices in history. But anyway, uh, that I could see happening. It's just not super likely. And then there's about a 1% chance that it just straight up overturns Roe. I think for this to happen, you would almost have to have Roberts, and not Roberts of late. I mean Roberts from like 10, 15 years ago. 
We'd have to go back in a time machine, get that Justice Roberts, and bring him back now. And then we might have a pretty decent shot at actually getting Roe overturned. But I don't see that happening. And the truth is, we'd probably have to also bring back Scalia and kick off Kavanaugh. And even then, I'm still skeptical that Gorsuch would join. And so you, you can see how this is just a very narrow shot. I would love for this to happen. I would love for Roe to be overturned. And remember that if that happened, it wouldn't be like, okay, abortion is banned in all 50 states. No, it would go back to the states. It would be a state issue if they did that. I mean, could the court theoretically write a opinion that says, nope, abortion is banned in all 50 states. The unborn are, are people and they have a right to life. I guess it's possible, but I just, I can't see it happening. I, I really can't. And so... We'll see how this turns out. They may try to reset the viability standard to something that's something of a an objective thing like they tried to do with the viability, even though viability is a moving target. But I really have no idea. I, I could not, I could, there are so many different ways that this thing could go within that, that second option that it wouldn't surprise me basically no matter what we do. But um, Justice Thomas is really the only jurist that is sitting on the high court right now that has publicly said Roe was incorrectly decided. And that just gives you sort of an idea of the shot that we've got at this. Now, do I believe that probably Amy Coney Barrett and Samuel Alito agree with that? Yeah, they, they probably do, but they've not publicly said it. And so it just seems as though there is not much of an appetite on the court to overturn this abysmal law and, and end the worst practice in American history. And yes, I'm including slavery on that. It goes abortion and then slavery. It is unconscionable to me that this is something that continues to go on in our country. But I think that that leaves me with my advice to you. Pray for the nation. Just pray that this works out, that we will end this practice and pray for the jurists involved. I, I don't, anticipate a lot of good here, but with God, all things are possible. And I do think prayer makes a difference. So continue to pray for our Supreme Court and our nation. To convince you to like this video and subscribe to my channel, I'm about to do some political impersonations. First up, Bernie Sanders. It is immoral that in this country, the top 1% of YouTubers get all the likes and subscriptions. John Kerry, please remember to ring the notification bell. President Joe Biden, if you like the show, call the TV guide and tell them. You know, the thing, Kamala Harris. Batman would want you to like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs>